Hey everyone, welcome back to the Commercial Real Estate Library. I'm Dana Tamanawala. This is Garrett McGillivray, and with us today we are joined by Dan Chirimetto, who is the Managing Director of Canadian Real Estate Investment Banking at Canaccord Genuity. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, first, let's just, we'll dive right into it. Uh, how, what, what does it mean to be the Managing Director of a real estate investment banking group? Uh, sure. Well, um, what does it mean to be the managing director? Effectively, it is a sales role, uh, as my job is to go out and uh, find new uh, corporate clients or expand relationships with existing corporate clients that are looking for assistance, um, primarily with public capital markets initiatives. Uh, so typically that would mean, you know, I, I guess the classic example is going public. I want to take my company public and, um, you know, you're going to need to retain the services of an investment bank to get that done. Uh, and that's where a guy like me comes in. So I'll work with the corporate client, um, you know, at the C-level, CEO, CFO, CIO type of um, people and yeah. help, help sort of structure transactions. So it's highlight real type of stuff in a, uh, you know, in a company's evolution. Um, so right. that's sort of what, what the role is, if that answers the question. Yeah. All, all the big stuff that you kind of read about in the papers. Uh, nice. Yeah. It's sometimes it's really satisfying when it does, you know, hit uh, the Globe and Mail or the Financial Post. Yeah. A lot of the times it doesn't. Um, uh, but yeah, some, especially some of the, like the big ticket M and a advisory, that's the stuff that you'll oh, read yeah. about in the paper from time to time. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, and I'm excited to get to some of those, some of those big ones that yeah. you, you've worked on. Um, how did you just a little background context? So how did you get into that position? So obviously, so we, we met, uh, just at an Ivy event a couple of weeks ago and you were on a panel with, uh, Peter Cuthbert who, who runs Fiera and Sheila Botting, uh, and some other great individuals. Um, how, how did you get to this position? I'm completely by accident. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, I didn't have any, you know, kind of grand designs, uh, around it when I started. So I, I joined Canaccord 14 years ago. Um, yeah, coming straight out of undergrad and all I knew at the time was I wanted to try out investment banking. I had no idea yeah. really what it was. It was this big black box. It seemed really challenging and exciting. Um, so I said, okay, go for it. And I was very fortunate to get a position, um, you know, right at school. And, um, when I started, I was working across all industries. I was doing stuff, a lot of stuff in mining, a lot of stuff in technology and life sciences, real estate among them. Yeah. Uh, but but a lot of other things and I really just kind of fell into it um, at the time when I started uh, the firm had decided to get a real estate practice off the ground uh, hired a yeah. couple of great individuals um, and uh, real estate at the time is just kind of getting started just, just getting started yeah they had the, the firm well uh, it was yeah the REIT sector in Canada was a, fra a fraction of what it is today so right. I mean, whether by fluke or by grand design, the firm picked a great time to start a real estate franchise. But I was fortunate enough to be there, you know, right to see it from day one. Um, and, you know, it's just the kind of thing where uh, experience, you know, begets experience and success begets success. Okay. So we transaction number one led to transaction number two, led to transaction number three and on and on. And, you know, before long, I'm the real estate guy. I'm like, okay, I guess I'm the real estate guy now. Right. Um, but I, but I, I, I tell that story because I've come to realize it's um, it's really a phenomenal sector, uh, at least from the perspective of an investment banker, um, because you can really immerse yourself in uh, in the sector. And there's only so many industries in Canada where you can really do that because mm. you need scale. Mm. And real estate's at um, at a place right now where there's sufficient scale within the capital markets where you can be completely dedicated to the sector, become a subject matter expert, uh, which is something that I have a lot of passion for. Uh, so you uh, you helped the acquisition of, or you advised on the acquisition of Amica by Baybridge, which is owned by Ontario Teachers Pension, uh, pension Plan. Um, can you discuss a little bit about how a transaction like that comes about? You know, the total price tag, I think it was 986 million. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, so how does that happen? And for those who don't know, Amica is a senior's housing. We had uh, Steve Susky on here the other week. Um, 
they're another uh, giant seniors housing player. Mm -hmm. uh, how does a transaction like that come about? Uh, first of all, great people uh, on the team. We, uh, as a firm, uh, and my colleagues had wonderful relationship with the company uh, that, um, that dates back a long, long way. Um, so, I mean, you ask how that transaction comes about. So that uh, Amica was acquired in 2015. I would say that that's a transaction that started in 2004. Okay, uh, when you started. Well, but it, it, predates, <laughs> it certainly predates my existence at Canaccord. Um, and uh, the first thing that, that as a firm we ever did with Amica was uh, raise some equity for them in a relatively small private placement. I think the number was around $8 million, um, which is not, you know, that headline, you know, front cover of the globe mm -hmm. grabbing transaction. Right. Um, but it set them on a path and uh, they went on to do some really special things is that they say that they want to be in the seniors housing space and then were they already in the seniors housing space they yeah they had a couple of um they, they were um they were at the time uh, predominantly focused on uh management uh, and development i wouldn't say mm -hmm. that i'd say that operations are something that they really grew into um, and I think that the company would, ag would agree with me on that. Um, but the, it, it was a, a story that evolved over time. Um, uh, you know, when you're raising a small private placement for a company like that, they're, they're in growth mode. And right. it was really the first transaction in a series of, um, from Canaccord's perspective, you know, a, the, a growing corporate finance relationship. So we went on to raise, I think the number was in aggregate, about $140 million of equity uh, for Amica over the next 10 years. Okay. And, and, and who, sorry, yeah. sorry to interrupt, yeah. who are you getting that? You probably would know a lot better about this, but I'll just ask the question anyways. Who are you getting the capital from? Like, are you going out to private family? Is it, is it public markets for most of this? Public markets. So uh, institutional and retail investors. So retail investors, you know, that's, that's you and that's me and that's anybody with an RSP account that wants to, you know, sock some money away into and they like seniors housing. Right. Uh, institutional investors in Canada are different from the types of institutions you'd see participate in the public markets in the U.S. In the U.S., um, it's uh, when we say institutions, it really is like proper institutions like endowment funds and pension funds. Um, in Canada, those types of investors tend to invest purely privately. Um, so the institutional investors that we work with um, most of the time tend to be uh, investment managers themselves. So they'll, they'll manage investment or retail investment. Um, you know, wealth as well, right. just on a kind of an institutional basis. So it's those mm -hmm. types of investors that we're going out to. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, that's, that's it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. And then, so you raised 140 million approximately over a number of years mm -hmm. for Amica. And then what happened? And, and by the way, they're using that money to go out and acquire like competitors or mostly, development? Mostly they used it for ground up development. Okay. Um, they only, they never acquired a competitor. The closest thing that they ever did to acquisition was they bought a property in Belleville, Ontario from a third party. It's the only property, the only third party property they had ever acquired. Right. Uh, otherwise their portfolio was, you know, built brick by brick mm. um, from the ground up. So uh, that's seldom do you see that. That's a pretty unique model. Right. Um, it, most of the time when, when public companies are real estate public companies are growing, they're buying properties from others. So Amica was a bit of a different beast. Right. Yeah. Okay. And then, and then how did things snowball from there? Um, how did it snowball? So I, they, they spent the money well. <laughs> okay. Uh, they yeah. built a great business out yeah. of it. They um, uh, grew their portfolio to, I think it was uh, 32 properties um, around the time of the sale. Uh, and they made it very attractive to competitors. So um, phenomenal locations in, uh, in only in primary markets. And it really was like the four seasons of seniors living in Canada. Yeah. Really nicely appointed mm -hmm. um, 
you know, high margin business. I like to hear that. My yeah. grandparents are in a Amica place Great. Right well, I'm now. sure they're very yeah. comfortable. That's good. Yeah. It's, um, yeah. I've, I've toured a number of their properties and it's the kind of place where you'd want your, you know, your family to be. It's, it's, uh, they, they, take such great care of their residents. And it's really, uh, they call them communities yeah. for a reason. Um, and it just became so attractive to, um, you know, to anybody that, that's looking to grow in the space. Um, so, um, you know, when um, uh, there was an approach um, mm. and that sort of, that kicked off a process to um, explore who could be a buyer. Right. So, so I guess this is the ownership of the company is like, you know, I think we're at a large enough scale. Maybe we can find a, a big company to take us over at a premium. Mm -hmm. or something uh, like that. Is that kind of, yeah, that's, that yeah. was kind of it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they didn't start it on their own, right. They probably would have just been happy to continue running the business, but there right. was a reason why they decided to go down that path. And, um, you know, I, because so because Canaccord was there all the way back in 2004, yeah. helping them with the you know the small private placement type of transaction, uh, and helped them along the way. We na naturally built up a, a very close relationship, and I you know I, I credit to my colleagues for doing this because um, uh, it really is a case study of how to manage uh, sort of a you know a corporate client relationship as an investment banker. And yeah. you know we're there to be in pole position for that that type of advisory role when the when the chance came along right right okay and then the actual transaction itself what happened uh well there was great interest I mean, the, the 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 amica was trading i think around um seven in the seven dollar range um before anything uh before they're they received an initial overture um and it it ticked up a little bit over the course of the process to around nine dollars and it wound up getting sold for over eighteen dollars a share, which is wow. I mean, that's a premium. You don't really ever see that in yeah, real huge. estate. Normally real estate portfolios tend to trade around um their net asset value. The assets are pretty liquid. Right. Mm -hmm. Um that's you know, stable cash flow, you throw a cap rate on it. Public markets tend to figure out what NAV is and the stock price usually reflects that. So to to get something to get a taken out at over a hundred percent premium is really rare. So what was going on? Why? <laughs> yeah. <here>? What? Um, <laughs> uh, how do we do that? There's a, <laughs> how, do how, do how do we do that? How do we replicate it? Um, a couple of things, a as I mentioned, the portfolio is phenomenal. Um, right. primary <laughs> markets, great locations. And once it's gone, once, you know, it, it, it falls to a competitor, there is no other, you know, there's no other Amica out there. So it became mm -hmm. uh, almost defensive um, to, to, to acquire it, I think. Right. Do you want to be in seniors really housing? Scarcity. or yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, number two, I mean, there was a, um, a, a, some development exposure you know, in, the, um, in the portfolio, including some very valuable land in, in a great market that wasn't being properly valued in the public markets because mm. public markets don't really understand land value. Uh, and finally, I mean, um, uh, it, Amica was acquired by a pension fund. Um, and if you think about um, duration matching, which is an important principle for, for a pension fund, what possible better investment could you have than an investment in a senior's housing platform? Right. Your, the, the duration of your assets matches your liabilities. It's perfect. Um, and they have a cost of capital that's just impossible to beat. Um, so it's, it would be very difficult for private enterprise to compete um, with a pension fund for an asset that that pension fund really wants. Mm -hmm. They'll just get priced out. Right. What would you think would be your uh, most interesting transaction that you've had to deal with? Most interesting? Um, I don't think that there's any <coughs> one individual transaction, uh, but instead I'll tell you um, a story of a client that I've worked with for a long time. Um, the company's Artist Reit. Yep. Um, you I know, know it. Yeah. yeah. Um, Artist was the very first transaction that I worked on when I started. Uh, I joined in May of '05, and we closed a fifty-five million dollar equity and convertible venture deal for them in uh, July of that year, July or August of that year. So, like, I got in the door, and boom, I was working on the Artist deal. Uh, and uh, so, not only was it um, I like to think that it was our very first real estate transaction. We had done some stuff prior, like I mentioned with Amica, um, but it was certainly mine. And it really kicked off a 
long relationship um, with a company that went on to do some really special things. Uh, they, uh, after that, uh, following that, raised about $2 billion of uh, primarily equity capital, mm-hmm. um, grew the business from like a three-person operation to, I mean, I don't know how many employees they have now, but I think probably north of 100. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can see their logo on the skyline if you're ever in downtown Winnipeg. They've got, they, they bought, um, I think the building's 360 Main, and, y- you know, you can see the artist logo. And that's, th- to think, like, right. that's really special. I was, a, I was a part of that. I was a part of, um, you know, something that, that got this thing going. And look at what it's gone on to do. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't take credit for, for, for doing that, but to know that you've been a part of, uh, building something uh, is a pretty special feeling to have, and that takes place over you know a long time. Yeah, those are, those guys own some large properties in Toronto too. Like yeah, they, they do. The Home Depot property that everybody sees going up the the DVP. I think yeah, they own that. That's right. right. I yeah, that I believe that's while. right. Yeah, and they've got some um, uh, some residential development projects as well. Right. Yeah. Um, and and what. Uh, how do you decide, um, like if I'm going out and want to start a fund or something, how do I decide between going to Canaccord or like a First National or a Trez for financing? When you're, is it just the difference of equity being a part of it? or Yeah, e- equity is, um, I mean, that's something that we specialize in. Pub- it's almost exclusively public capital markets. So often I'll, have, uh, I'll be approached by groups that are looking to do something privately, and that's more difficult to do. Um, mm. at least for us, uh, because our expertise really lies in public capital markets. Um, right. you know, so we work with clients that, that need liquidity, daily liquidity, um, that, you know, often, um, would want a pretty substantial dividend yield. And that really sort of lends itself to scale, uh, and, um, and being sort of the size of being running a public company. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Just bring it to like a base level, like. What what is the process of approaching the public capital markets? Because I understand the the private part because mm-hmm. you know you just approach an individual, ask them for money, and they say yes or no. <laughs> but public, obviously, being considerably more complicated, how does that happen? Yeah, there's so many ways for it to go wrong, and only one way for it to <laughs> go right. And it's if <laughs> all of the ways it can go wrong, none of them go wrong. Um, so it's a lot of um, First of all, I think it starts with the thesis. Like, what is, what is something that the public markets um, are telling us that they're looking for? Mm. Um, so, you know, you look at, um, you know, what are the asset classes that are performing? What are the sectors that are performing? What are the comps that, um, that are doing well? What are the ones that aren't? That's, that's going to tell you, you know, what, what investors want. Um, and then it's, you know... Uh, finding opportunities uh, in those, you know, in those areas uh, and people, credible people to do it with um, and structuring it in such a way that it's going to be, you know, well received and, uh, you know, kind of meet the rigor of, you know, I- institutional governance requirements. Mm-hmm. So there's, there, it's a lot of planning. It takes, um, you know, for, for example, in an IPO, um, Formally, there's probably three months of behind the scenes work before even the preliminary prospectus gets filed, and realistically, probably even some work in advance of that as well. Um, so it's it's a very long sales cycle, I guess, mm-hmm. uh, and it's a lot of planning, that's for sure. So in terms of like the background work, I assume that like they get audited financial statements yeah. and like all that regulatory work and stuff like that. But when you approach the market, you guys are setting the price, right? As the investment banker. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. And then you're betting on whatever, nine bucks a share or something like that. Right. Yeah. We're, um, we're not actually buying it ourselves, yeah, uh, but, you're but s- we're selling it to clients that will. So our part of our job, a big part of our job is to, um, you know, figure out pricing or valuation that's going to a clear the market yeah. uh, and be you know be acceptable to our corporate clients so it's finding that that middle ground back uh, to my one question so when you guys do approach the public markets do you do it on a best efforts basis or do you guys have like some contractual it thing? depends um 
Uh, it depends on the situation. An IPO is a best efforts basis. Yeah. Um, if it doesn't work, no one, nobody's on the hook for anything aside yeah. from the costs that they've incurred. Um, for established companies, we will do what's called a bot deal, which okay. is um, where we are committing our capital and there is certainty of, uh, of pricing for, for the corporate client. So that's where we say, uh, you, well, a public company will come to us and say, I'm looking at buying a, you know, this portfolio, I'll need $50 million. Uh, and you as the investment banker say, okay, well, let, I'll bid you on terms. So if your pr pr stock's trading at $7, I'm gonna bid you at some discount to $7. And um, the company agrees, you go, go bought, and your job is then to turn around and you know, uh, ultimately sell that, um, sell that instrument to mm. uh, to a long-term investor uh, so corporate clients love it because it gives them certainty of pricing yeah but it does take you know you're taking on risk and liability because if you can't sell it the yeah. firm owns it like yeah you're the com the company gets the money in any event yeah uh, so you've got to make sure that it's priced appropriately and when you guys do bought deals do you guys get additional incentives because you're taking on a lot more risk presumably no no um, no, we don't. Um, we we don't get any sort of upside in. Okay. Well, I mean, it, there. I guess if a deal doesn't sell and we do have to take down the stock, um, it hopefully will trade up. Yeah. Um, often it doesn't. Hopefully. Um, but there's no there's no additional incentive. Our job or our how we're paid is really just on a on a commission okay, basis. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. Where where are you seeing international? Uh, capital coming from do, do you lot of, do you see a lot of inflow to canada do you um not a ton but i operate in sort of a, a tiny little sphere of real estate that um isn't going to see big international you know capital influxes like you'll you might see in the residential housing industry um public capital markets are this tiny real estate are this tiny tiny little you know, little dinghy of a boat that floats on the sea of right. residential real estate. Um, so while that may be something that's that's taking place at scale in, in sort of the private residential market, we haven't really seen a lot of that in um, either on the commercial end of the scale with exceptions um, and certainly not sort of on the investor side of things. It's tend, we tend to really work with Canadian investors. Real estate's a local business, right? Right. So uh, investors tend to be uh, fairly local. And there have yeah. been some exceptions to that. Like there have been, um, for example, Anbong uh, came into Canada uh, a couple of years ago and made some very big acquisitions of uh, office buildings and uh, some commercial towers as well. That seems to be kind of unwinding itself. Right. Um, <laughs> and, but there are, there are some other examples as well, but not a lot. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's what we see the same thing uh, in our business selling buildings. All every single owner says, "Okay, well, are you going to get the big Chinese buyer? Where's the where's yeah. the where's the big Korean buyer? Where's the 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 German buyer?" And it's yeah. like, like yeah, but you know, in order for them to pay a premium, they really have to understand it. And yeah, at the end of the day, in Canada, we don't have that big returns on real estate, especially yeah. I'm, I'm in multi-res. It's like get the big foreign buyer to get a 3% return <laughs> is, uh, is a bit of an ask. It's so, a tough sell, isn't uh, it? Yeah. 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 So they're in the mix, but they're usually not the top, uh, top buyer, but, yeah. um, but okay. Another question. So speaking of, um, multi-res, so like I heard this recently that a lot of these larger groups that are out buying, uh, consistently, um, they raise a lot of their money based on their corporate bond rate. Can you do, can you discuss a little bit about that and like how like I heard one group, for instance, that's selling a, a large portion of its portfolio that they're doing so because internationally their corporate bond rate is at risk of declining. Not so like uh, how, okay. How does that affect? Uh, uh, what can people borrow at based on that and like. I mean, is that is that a big part of a real estate organization? Yeah, uh, for the bigger ones, uh, it is. Yeah, it, it can be uh, often the dominant part of um, of a larger com company's capital stack is sort of that corporate bond. Um, you know, senior unsecured debentures is the nomenclature we would use, I guess. 
Um, and it's very attractive pricing. Um, yields right now are in the you know low single digits, um, mid to low single digits. Um, which, if you you know compare it to like a I don't know a seven percent dividend yield on your equity, yeah, I'd rather take the cheap corporate bond, um, right. especially because it's um, it's it's unsecured. It doesn't encumber any of, any of your properties, so it gives the company a lot of flexibility uh, in managing its balance sheet. Um, the challenge with that type of instrument is it's only available to larger companies. Uh, right. It would require an investment grade credit rating which um, I think that right now the smallest REIT with an investment grade rating is around a billion and a half or $2 billion of market cap. That's pretty big. Okay. In the U.S., it's much more prevalent of an instrument. Preferred shares are much more prevalent of an instrument. Um, but it, Canada hasn't really seen that much of an evolution uh, in, um, in access to you know, non-equity products. Now talking about uh, opportunities in the Canadian landscape. So something that I thought was really interesting, you mentioned a couple weeks ago, was that there, there, there's a big opportunity in data centers uh, or data centers. Well, can you speak to that a little bit and, and what you're seeing in the market? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think there is a really big opportunity in data centers. It's, it's one of the things that I'm uh, most excited about. Uh, I think it's, we're, um, I think that we're at the cusp of something big happening there. Because if you look at what's going on in the world, um, and it, we're just becoming more connected. We are using more and more data. Um, there's more and more things happening on the cloud. Um, and that all takes place somewhere. It doesn't actually happen literally in the cloud. Right. There's a data center that, that traffic is uh, either being routed through or that da data is being stored in. Um, so I think that there's going to be um, like a, a secular expansion in that uh, in that asset class as we continue to um, you know become a more and more digitized society. I guess that's sort of the grand scale, right? Uh, and, and you're seeing it in the U.S. So generally, you know, the U.S. is going to be on the, le the leading edge of um, you know most <laughs> most things, and certainly that is the case of uh, capital markets and real estate. And there is a, a whole ecosystem of data center REITs that exist um, that are really big. In aggregate, if you add up all the, the market caps, they're bigger than the entire Canadian REIT space. <laughs> it's massive. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and looking at how they've performed, they've been an absolute darling of a, um, uh, among the REIT sector over the last five years plus. Right. Um, is, by the way, is it are there many companies in the space or is it like because the only companies that I would know about are like Google and Amazon and Oracle mm. running yeah kind of the companies you may have never heard of um, like uh, Digital Realty and Equinix and Coresight and Cyrus One and right. uh, QTS like right. th these are companies whose job it is to just own a data center uh, it, it varies but um, uh of the model is generally own the data center and lease it out to somebody that needs it, like the tenant that's mm. going to put servers and racks there and and flow traffic through there, like a Google or an Amazon or you know an Oracle. Got it. So yes, mm. those those companies will own sometimes own their own data sites, um, but often it's not the core part of their business. It's capital intensive, so it's a perfect opportunity for a REIT type of structure to come in and um, you know earn that lower but still attractive and but and stable return while you know facebook google and amazon can focus on doing what they do best which is something outside of real estate right so i think the same thing's going to happen in canada um you're seeing it a little bit um there's there's some interest in the data center space um already uh within the public capital markets there's a couple groups that have um uh, made some investments and i don't think it's a total coincidence that uh, they've been well received by the market, uh, so I think that we're we're going to see more of that, and um, uh, you know, uh, looking for uh, from my perspective, looking for opportunities to capitalize on what I th see as being uh, the next sort of trend over the next five years. I mean, look at look at what's going on uh, in industrial right now, versus what's happening in retail. So there's this this theme, 
and I think it's broadly incorrect, but it exists nonetheless, is that, oh, the, the retail is, you know, is going Dead. through. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you look at the, the actual operating results, it's, um, that's not the case at all. Right. Um, fundamentals are actually really solid. Like if you look at the results for First Capital or Smart Centers, Real Can, like they're really good. Yeah. Um, but their, their stock prices are depressed because of this, this um, perception. And industrial is um, trading at really healthy valuations um, because, the, again, this perception is everything's going to go through Amazon, which is going to require more distribution centers and less mm -hmm. retail malls. Right. Well, if, if you believe that, then I think that the more direct beneficiary um, is going to be data centers themselves because before it hits an Amazon warehouse, it's going to have to go through an Amazon server, which is going to be stored somewhere. Okay. Uh, and then where, where should we expect to see this? Because uh, like something else that uh, like was big when Bitcoin was around, but the cost of uh, warehousing of, of space that can, that can have this, and especially the cost of power for yeah. data centers. Um, cannabis companies are running into this problem right now. Where, should, where would we expect to see these data centers popping up? There's nodes um, through the US. Uh, I, I think that it's mostly going to be a US phenomenon. Um, and there are actual really important data center markets like uh, Northern Virginia um, is a place that has sort of spawned this really important data center market. And if you think about why, well, think of all the government that is located around, you know, Northern Virginia mm. and um, why the, especially like military, um, uh, you know, applications is going to require a lot of data. Uh, there's going to be a lot of connectivity, fiber, power. Um, so, so it's wherever you see sort of this intersection of connectivity, fiber, power, and an end user base that requires it. I think that's where you'll start to see, um, not start to see, but continue to see data centers proliferate. Um, and just, uh, just a quick question. Do the data centers have to be located closely to, like, if I'm putting something in the cloud, does it matter the proximity? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. latency is... Um, uh, is a big issue and being able to save 30 milliseconds um, on latency is is a really big deal and so proximity uh, can be a big factor there and and then what's your uh, I think I um, it was I'm forgetting her name but the lady from King set really intelligent lady who's oh, on the panel with um, you. Uh, I'm sorry I'm for, uh, forgetting too okay I'll edit that one in sure um, but she was mentioning how like you know people are designing buildings for the future these days and something that we might not need in the future <laughs> is parking space yeah. because of autonomous vehicles and she was she was saying how she went on to say that they've explored you know what would it be like to have a data center in some of their parking garages and how could you convert that space mm -hmm. is that something that we could expect in the future or is I, I'd be surprised if parking structures could be converted into data centers maybe parkade like above ground park parkades okay uh but i don't think anything underground would be a good application for a data center ah, okay uh, because of water penetration um oh. so it's very important that this equipment stays dry um so you would want i, I and i've seen be a below grade data center before um what you need to make absolutely sure is that it is watertight and there's nothing is is going to get in right mm -hmm. that is expensive equipment yes okay i'm going to fire these recognizing you got to leave in like two minutes or exactly. so uh, i'm going to fire these off quickly what so data centers very prevalent in the u.s not as much in canada so big opportunity here mm -hmm. um among other you know things that we discussed uh what other opportunities are maybe large and or prevalent in the US but not as uh, oh sure uh, not that not not so much in Canada yeah um, uh, self storage is another uh, industry that I think is really interesting um, that is uh, if, you, if you look at like the per capita um, usage of self storage like uh, it's two times the amount in the US as, as it is in Canada and there's some fundamental reasons for that Canadians have basements and a lot of Americans don't. Right. Um, but, um, you know, the fact that we've got, you know, one public company focused on self-storage and it's an absolute darling, I think, means that over time there, there might be more uh, that, that we see. Okay. And there's a whole space of them in the U.S. Okay. Um, 
Can I do your last question? Yes. Uh, okay, final question. This question's called The Three Truths. Uh -huh. um, so imagine years from now, uh, you live to be 150 <laughs> and you achieve everything that you ever wanted to, uh, and you had a fantastic life, and you were surrounded by your family and your, your kids and your great grandkids, and, and everybody's there, uh, but for whatever reason, it's your last day, and everything that you've ever written, everything, every talk that you've ever gave, uh, all the books that you published, uh, they have been, they're, they're gone. Uh, they've been erased. And you have three short notes that you can write to pass on to your friends and your family and, and people who hold you in high regard. Um, what would you put on those notes? Uh, wow, that's a heck of a question. Um, <laughs> can be about anything. About anything. Um, I guess I'm going off the cuff here, like focus on what really matters in life. Um, act with integrity uh, and have fun. Don't yeah. take yourself too seriously. Yeah. Nice. Thanks, Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, guys.